Thanks, Dhruva, and thanks to you and Anit for inviting me to this uh, very special event by ORF America. So I thought I'll uh, speak about, I can't speak about climate or debt, so I'm going to speak about digitization. And I'll speak basically about a concept called digital public infrastructure and why it's so important and strategic. Now, this is a word which has gained a lot of currency in recent times, but the idea of digital public infrastructure or DPI is not new. When you look at the history of modern technology, the entire internet was digital public infrastructure. If you look at the history of the internet, it was uh, set up by the US government, funded by DARPA, and for many years it was used by scientists and nerds and so on to do things. And then it got a big leap forward in 1991 when Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in Europe built the World Wide Web, or WWW, and came up with the protocols to create HTML and so on. So the first part of the internet was funded by the US government. The second part, the World Wide Web, came out of CERN, which actually is funded by most European countries. And then the next important evolution of the internet was the development of Mosaic, which was the browser built at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign by Mark Andreessen in 1994, again funded by the National Science Foundation. So up till 1994, the internet was entirely funded by public taxpayer money in the US, and therefore it was an example of digital public infrastructure. Then of course, Mr. Andreessen went to US, joined hands with James Clark and set up Netscape. And the rest is history because that's when the rise of the private internet began. And internet, Netscape, the Microsoft responded with Explorer, then Amazon came, Google came, and so on. So fundamentally, we have to think of the first few decades of the internet as public infrastructure. And that public infrastructure was designed on well-established protocols and APIs or programming interfaces. So you had HTTP, HTML, SMTP for email, and so on. So the two requirements that were met by 1994, one was the fact that there was already an existing network, and the second was standard protocols. And after that, private innovation began in a huge way. And so you saw the rise of all these great companies on top of this infrastructure. So when you think about it, there was digital infrastructure at population scale, there was a set of APIs and protocols, and then there was market innovators who led on that. The same thing happened with the GPS. The GPS was an investment made by the US government, initially for tracking you know, targets for you know, precision uh, accuracy. And then in the year 2000, one of the last acts of President Clinton was to put GPS in the public domain so that any private or commercial user could use GPS. And then again, so GPS was again a public infrastructure paid for by the taxpayer on which you had APIs and then released for commercial use in, 19, in, in the year 2000. And then that led again to maps. Maps led to car, car hailing. So again, on top of GPS, there was a whole set of innovations which were done by private companies. So the concept of digital public infrastructure is essentially, you know, digital investment, I mean, investment either by the, gov by the state or by, enabled by the state to create some kind of uh, common infrastructure that can be used by everybody. Then on top of that, layering protocols and other things that allow them to be interoperable and be used by many applications, and then creating an infrastructure of private innovation that builds on top of that. So it's a, not a new idea. Now what we, what we have done in India has essentially been built on this same idea, but extended forward into what we think is the needs of a more modern era. Now, we know that the digital intensity of our societies has gone up dramatically. Uh, we saw that in the pandemic, where we were all cooped up at home and we were getting our entertainment on our electronic devices. We were talking to our friends on electronic devices. We were ordering goods on electronic devices. We were getting our food on our electronic devices, and so on and so forth. So fundamentally, digital intensity of our society has gone up, and none of all of you who will probably take furtive glances at your smartphones, know that very well. Now, if that is, to be, if that is so, do we, one, of course, one school of thought could be to say, look, everything is going fine and let, you know, let, markets are doing well, there's so much innovation, so let it continue, and it should, because markets are very important. But at the same time, when you look at, if digital intensity of a society is going to be so high, 
then I think we need to think in terms of what is the public policy, what is the technology, what is the institutional arrangements, what is the governance of technology in this new world in a way that it creates a larger value or larger benefit. In other words, how do we ensure that technology reaches everybody? How does, how does the whole population get access to technology? How do we ensure that it, it, is, it is a, creates a, a, a market uh, level playing field that allows innovation to flourish? How do we make sure that it's cheap and low cost so that it's not a bar cost is not a barrier of entry? How do we make sure that it is accessible in multiple languages so that people who are, don't know English or people who, don't, who can't read can still use it and so on? So there is a part of new digital technology is how do we create these things in a way that it is more universal and more inclusive? And that's really what DPI is all about. How do we do that? And this is not just a developing country issue. It's actually an issue for all countries because we have become so, in, our lives have become so entwined with modern technology that we need to step back and take a look at what is the architecture of this technology. And that's exactly the journey that uh, we had done in India, which was to design a set of interoperable building blocks or protocols. All of them were at population scale, and population scale means 1.4 billion people. All of them were at very, very low cost. All of them were at very small transaction value. All of them were designed to be used by everybody. And those tools or those infrastructures are responsible, we believe, for a lot of the uh, activity in India. And now it's becoming apparent that it's actually having an impact on society and the economy. So what did we do? First, we built a ID platform called Aadhaar. And Aadhaar is uh, essentially a very simple ID which is given to 1.4 billion people. Uh, the ID has very basic elements. It only has the name, address, date of birth, sex of a person. And they can choose their own name in the system. So you, know, you can come with whatever name you want. It's like landing at Staten Island. You can choose any name you want. And then uh, we, we had to get in the biometrics because we had to ensure uniqueness of every, every individual. And this system was built uh, starting in 2009. And I had the privilege of leading the project, the UIDAI, and my colleague, Pramod Verma is here, who was the chief architect. And we began this journey in 2009. And by 2014, uh, we had reached 600 million people with the ID. Because we had built a platform for scale. We had built a platform to enroll one and a half million people a day. We had built a platform which was costing maybe about a dollar per person to enroll. So it was ch relatively cheap. And we also designed it. And here, I think it's important to realize that the principles of the original internet were important to us, which is why we said, while we will create this digital public infrastructure, we will build a set of protocols and APIs so that any, anyone can use this for any application. And the two, what we are, and we offer only two services on this infrastructure. One was authentication that says, John is John, Abdul is Abdul, Ashok is Ashok. And the second was electronic KYC, or electronic know your customer which is something that you need to do when you need to open a bank account or get a mobile connection. So there were two very simple services on top of this ID. But they were made available as APIs, and they were made available at population scale. Today, this ADA system has 1.3 billion people in it. And the usage is something like 80 million authentications a day. In other words, every day, 80 million times, somebody is using this authentication. Uh, for verification of the ID for some purpose or the other. And it has maybe 5 to 10 million electronic KYCs a day, which means every day somebody somewhere is using it 5 to 10 million times to open a bank account or get a mobile connection. So this is a very good example of building it exactly in the original uh, you know, model of. The difference was that when the internet evolved, it, it didn't evolve because there was a premediated plan to make it happen like that. It, it was a series of. Uh, things which happened, which finally led to the explosion of innovation post-95. In the case of the Indian infrastructure, because we had the advantage of being able to look back and what, what ha see what had happened in the, in, in, in the US and elsewhere, we actually could take a view and say, look, there's a, st there's a construct here which actually uh, has a strategic value. And that's what, uh, that's what led us to create the uh, uh, ID system using this infrastructure and using this approach of three layers of 
identity uh, of uh, you know digital infrastructure with inter protocols and allowing private innovation to flourish. Now, how did private innovation flourish on Aadhaar? First, let me explain how public innovation flourished because what 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 Aadhaar did was essentially make reduce the cost of onboarding a customer into a, a financial system or a mobile system because earlier. To open a bank account, it would take several days or weeks because people had to verify your identity. And in a country where many hundreds of millions of people didn't have any ID whatsoever, people actually were excluded from getting bank accounts. And this problem, as you know, was exacerbated uh, after 9-11. Because after 9-11, the FATF was set up and more and more stringent requirements were done for opening bank accounts. You had the PMLA Act and, and unless people could prove who they were, they couldn't open a bank account. So while there was a, a stringence, and while the barrier of opening a bank account was essentially increased for verification of identity reasons, it further disadvantaged people who didn't have any kind of ID. And therefore, the Aadhaar KYC, which uh, when we were at UIDI, we worked with the regulator and the central bank, they, got, they, they agreed to use the Aadhaar eKYC as a basic KYC to open a simple bank account. And this was in some sense a breakthrough idea that using your digital ID and an online verification, you could open a bank account in two minutes. And this was the basis of Prime Minister Modi's Jandan Yojana program, which was to do massive financial inclusion. And over the period like 2014, 2015 to 2020, Hundreds and millions of people got bank accounts for the first time using Aadhaar KYC. So this was a good example of the government leveraging this KYC to accelerate financial inclusion. And as a BIS report said recently, India achieved financial inclusion in eight years, what would normally have taken 45 years. In other words, you are able to accelerate financial inclusion using this technology. Now, this use of KYC for banking was not limited to uh, the government banks. Many new private banks also came up at that time because the Central Bank of India, the Reserve Bank, came out with the policy of creating a new category of banks called small banks and payment banks. So they wanted more competition in the banking sector. And all these small banks and payment banks, be it Paytm Payment Bank or Post Office Payment Bank or, you know, or uh, AU Bank or whatever, they all used Aadhaar KYC to accelerate getting customers. In other words, from a market perspective, the KYC became an instrument to decrease the cost of customer acquisition and increase competition in the banking space. So this is a good example of like, you know, markets using this technology. But the biggest example of the use of Aadhaar KYC for market penetration was done in 2016 when Reliance Geo uh, launched their Geo network. The Geo network was a very ambitious project of Mr. Mukesh Ambani to create the latest 4G network in the world in which he spent I don't know, 20 billion, 25 billion, nobody knows how much was spent on the network. But they had, they wanted to launch this modern network. And they also wanted to do customer acquisition very quickly and ramp up the customer base. And they, they set themselves, because they always set themselves large goals, they set themselves the goal of achieving 100 million customers in six months. They wanted to get 100 million new customers in six months. Now, till that time, electronic KYC was not really popular in the mobile industry. They were quite happy with some paper-based stuff and all that, and it didn't matter. But if your goal in life is to achieve 100 million customers in six months, you have to do 1 million customers a day. Now, if you want to do 1 million customers a day, then you can't do it the old-fashioned way with paper. You had to have an electronic means. So Geo embraced the Aadhaar KYC. The rules allowed you to open a, a mobile connection with, because in, unlike in the US, I can go to any shop and get a burner phone. You can't do that in, in the India. You need to do a KYC. So, uh, uh, so they came up with the architecture where they were doing a million KYCs a day, which is how they got to 100 million. And therefore, this is an example of a different sector, the mobile sector, where a newcomer came, and there were very powerful incumbents in that sector. The newcomer came, used the power of Aadhaar KYC, and dramatically changed the rules of the game. And because it was, uh, uh, it, it was uh, electronic KYC, they were able to get to 100 million customers, and they you know, took on the incumbents. And they also said, look, we're building this brand new 4G network, so let's make it very, very cheap to do data. 
And anyway, let's, we don't, we're going to make whatever money from data, so let's make voice free. So they made voice free. So in fact, in 2016, uh, voice became free in India because they said we'll make money on data. And they realized that the basic insight was that voice demand is inelastic. In other words, if you make voice free, it doesn't mean you'll speak to the, on the phone for six hours a day. I mean, some people may do, but by and large, you will not So they made data very cheap. And India's data consumption went from half a gig a month to half a gig a day. So a 30x increase in data consumption because of this dramatic uh, innovator coming in and changing the rules of the game. And this was possible because they could accelerate using other KYC. So the, another example of market innovation that was built on top of KYC. And then the government had built, had ensured the rollout of financial inclusion by opening these few hundred million bank accounts. Then the, what, what was the purpose of that? One of course was financial inclusion, but it was also to simplify the distribution of cash benefits to millions of vulnerable Indians. And therefore, the Aadhaar KYC opened the bank account. Because the bank account was opened with Aadhaar, the bank account had the Aadhaar number in it. And now the Aadhaar number could be used as a digital address to send money to. And therefore, using this, India builds the world's largest cash transfer program. And we built something called the Aadhaar Payment Bridge, where you could just say, send 1,000 rupees to Aadhaar number 123. And that automatically went into that bank account of that person in real time. And this, this plumbing, which allowed you to send money to you know, hundreds of millions of people electronically, was the basis of many, many welfare programs. And during the pandemic, it was used to transfer about $4.5 billion into 120 million bank accounts using this infrastructure. In other words, this infrastructure, which allowed opening of bank accounts, then allowed you to send money and created a resilience network for, for the vulnerable. I'm giving you the examples to show why digital public infrastructure is so important and how we have to think beyond what we have. And, and there are many, many other examples of that. Uh, India built a micropayment system called UPI, which does about 8.7 8 billion payments a month. And this has led to dramatic inclusion of people in the payment system. Uh, to give you a context, uh, we had about 6 million point of sale machines in India prior to that. Uh, today, we have 50 million locations where people have stuck QR codes and are taking uh, payments as, as low as 10 cents, uh, yeah, payments for you know, selling some vegetables or a coconut or something. So suddenly, this, this has led to massive financial inclusion and the ability to use uh, payments at a microtransaction level. So this was, uh, again, something else that was, was essentially enabled to expand the pace at which people became included in society. Because fundamentally, if, if a market player would start from the top, he'll say, how do I make money from the top 10 million, 50 million, 30 million? But when you're designing something for a billion people, you have to think differently. So how do you make it accessible to everyone? How do you make it universal and so on? And then there are many, many other things that are happening in the area of digital public infrastructure. There is a, a new project called ONDC, which is essentially disaggregating commerce and allowing anyone to be a buyer or a seller on an on a interoperable platform. There's uh, somebody else building an app uh, using a, a protocol called Beckon, which allows you to create mobility where the driver and the, and the, and the con customer can directly bilaterally negotiate and, and strike a deal. Uh, there, there is a lot of work happening applying AI and you know, generative AI and so on to make education more easier or to make uh, you know, services available in all 22 Indian major languages and, and many other things of that nature. But the one last thing I'll talk about, which is what we're doing in the area of data. So fundamentally, I think what what we have seen with data is that data ac accumulates or concentrates either in companies or in governments. And that's the nature of data, that if you roll out something, then there's going to be a, bio there's going to be a digital exhaust from those activities. And invariably, those, that exhaust aggregates somewhere. But in the Indian model, uh, again, because we came up with a fundamental insight, which is that Indians will be data rich before they're economically rich. It's important to understand this point, that if you look at the growth of the private internet in the US between 2000 and 2020, it was essentially led by digital advertising. 
because the U.S. had a few hundred billion dollars of revenue in advertising, in media, in television, and so on. And that revenue essentially migrated to the internet because everybody who had internet had a lot of income. You know, per capita income by forty, fifty thousand dollars a pop, and therefore it made sense to use the data that you had on the internet to make sure that the advertising was targeted towards you, and therefore the the model of business in India in the U.S. has essentially been advertising driven. However, in India where people are not that rich, uh, advertising is not really as lucrative as as it is in the West. However, the Indians will have a digital footprint which is as much as a person. So a person in Bihar who's using a smartphone will have the same or more digital footprint than a person in Boston because the, uh, both are doing similar activities. In fact, they're doing more activities in India on the phone because they're doing payments and so on. So fundamentally, the digital, infra, digital footprint of people is going to be as high, but the income is not going to be high. And therefore, can we flip this around and say, if data is, is going to be, can data become the new collateral for, for yeah, people to improve their lives? In other words, if I'm anyway going to create a digital exhaust of my life, can I use that data myself to get access to credit, get access to healthcare, to get access to jobs, to get access to skills? And this is actually the, most, one of the most profound ideas we have, which is how do we flip data around to make it useful to people, to empower them for their own use. And this data empowerment network uh, is now getting rolled out. Uh, there are about five million transactions now on that network, but I think over the next few years this will grow. And one of the biggest use cases will be uh, credit because there are 11 million, 12 million businesses on our GST, which is our indirect tax system. All of them are generating uh, tax returns and they're filing the invoice details with the GST because when you have a value-added tax system, the only way you can get your input tax credit is by filing invoices. And therefore, 11 million businesses are filing their invoice details with the GST. But if you flip that around and make that invoice details accessible to a lender and it's certified by the government that these invoices are actually real invoices, then that becomes information collateral which then the lender can use to give you a loan. And suddenly, 11 million businesses potentially can start getting loans with the power of their information collateral. So this is uh, another big idea which is getting rolled out, and this will lead to the growth of uh, MSME growth, uh, lending, and so on. And we also believe that if you can build an architecture where data is in the hands of people, then there is an incentive for you to formalize in the economy. Because this is a big challenge around the world. How do we bring a whole informal economy into the formal system? Because in, if we get them in the formal system, they can contribute, they can pay taxes, your tax base goes up, all that stuff. But there's no, there's no reason if I'm in, outside the formal system, why should I join the formal system? If it's going to mean a lot of bureaucracy to get into the formal system and on top of that they're going to hit me with taxes, it's not worth it. However, if, if you can figure out a way for people to use their own data, now suddenly you have the incentive to join the system. Because if I'm a small business, I can either remain outside the system and remain small because I don't have access to credit, my, my fi funding comes from my own savings or from my family or from a money lender, so I can't really scale my business. But if I join the formal system and the formal system is able to certify that this is my business volume, both on the buying side with invoices and on the selling side with digital payments, then I'll have access to commercial credit from the formal financial system at much better terms than informal credit. And this is, we think, sufficient incentive for someone to join the formal system. So to the way to think about it is that actually this digital infrastructure is also creating the path of formalizing a society and making people part of the economy. So net-net, my point is that Digital public infrastructure is strategic. It's important for countries to think about it. It's not a new idea. The original internet was based on that idea. It's something which will help in economic growth. It's something that will help in making societies more equitable. It's something that will help in, in increasing uh, taxes and therefore the economic strength and vitality of a country. It's something which will help in making sure that the benefit programs are much more efficient and targeted. So there's a whole host of macroeconomic and social benefits from digital public infrastructure. 
So I think it's an idea whose time has come and is here to stay. Thank you very much.